The time has come for me to talk about musicals. Well, one in particular anyway. Hi everyone, it's Lady Genevieve. If you follow me on Twitter, then you know I have some very strong opinions about certain musicals. Out of all of the musicals that I grew up watching, few have aged as well as West Side Story has. Today, I want to talk about why that musical was and still is relevant today the 1961 film adaptation, and the new film adaptation that is going to be coming out later this year. In order to properly discuss the significance of West Side Story, we need to go back, not to 1961 when the first feature film adaptation was released, nor to 1957 when the musical first premiered on Broadway. No, we need to go back hundreds of years to the end of the 16th century. Let's talk about William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet is simultaneously the most overrated and the most underrated of all of Shakespeare's plays. It has permeated the public consciousness and become a fixture in pop culture with numerous adaptations across multiple mediums. However, the story has been largely embraced as one about forbidden love, with a total lack of understanding of the deeper themes of the story. The long-standing feud between the Montagues and the Capulets is never explained in the story. It's something that has existed for as long as any of these characters are aware of. They are born into the middle of it and never question the legitimacy of why it is that they're supposed to despise the other side. There are never any noteworthy differences between these two groups either. In Franco Zeffirelli's adaptation, the Montagues have a propensity to wear more blue and the Capulets more of the red and orange hues, but it's ultimately an inconsequential surface level detail. You can strip it away and see that they're all just people. The main characters are mostly rambunctious children unprepared to confront the consequences of the violent hatred they've been indoctrinated into. Romeo and Juliet as characters are not actually actually in love with each other, they've only just met and gotten swept up into a passionate infatuation with one another. But it's important for them to be young and unjaded because they're still open-minded enough to follow their attraction to one another without deciding that a petty and toxic family feud is a good enough reason to hate each other instead. They are naive enough to think that knowing someone for less than a day is enough time to declare you're in love with one another, just as they are naive enough to think that a few nice words will be sufficient enough to stop generations of hatred. The prince delivers the final monologue of the play, and in it he berates the Montagues and Capulets for letting their hate run so rampant that even more lives have been lost. The audience is meant to be more shaken by this loss because they've spent the last couple of hours following these two young children getting swept up in a love affair. They're sweet and well-meaning, but why is it any more tragic than Mercutio and Tybalt losing their lives? The answer is that it's not. Just because Mercutio likes to mouth off and Tybalt has a temper does not mean that they deserve to die. And their lives being lost is just as tragic as the demise of Romeo and Juliet. The play and the better adaptations of it make a clear point of empathizing with these opposing groups and showing the deep heart of humanity that runs through everyone if they would only remember to be in touch with it. The story is there to show you how necessary it is to peel back all the layers of posturing, ego, and fellatio bigotry you've been taught, because if you don't, the consequences can be devastating. The tragedy of Romeo and Juliet is not only the loss of lives, but the loss of innocence as well. The story doesn't distinguish between good and evil people. Everyone has a capacity to end up with blood on their hands if they let their anger and hate get the best of them. West Side Story was conceived as a musical adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, and there were early discussions to have the feud be between an Irish Catholic group and a Jewish group, but eventually things shifted to have the feud be between the Jets, a white American gang, and the Sharks, a Puerto Rican American gang. West Side Story is brilliant for numerous reasons, from the songs to the dancing, but most important of all, it modernizes the play and effectively conveys the important themes of the original work. People can oftentimes be dismissive of the deeper themes of Romeo and Juliet and fail to recognize how relevant they still are today because of the clothes, the language, and the lack of elaborating on why the Montagues and Capulets hate each other. West Side Story presents these themes of the play in a context that more closely resembles the world we live in 
happening today, so it's more or less impossible for the audience to ignore what the story is actually about. Some of my favorite moments across all of these different adaptations of Romeo and Juliet are the ones that more intimately explore the emotional turmoil of young men that are being forced to confront the ugly realities of the hate and violence that they have been taught to glorify by life, society, and the people around them. It's worth noting that West Side Story came out before both Franco Zeffirelli and Boz Lerman's film adaptations of Romeo and Juliet. This lingering shot on Bernardo after Riff goes down is one of my favorite parts of the entire film, and it has such a powerful impact that we see a similar concept again in Zeffirelli and Lerman's Romeo and Juliet films later. There's a close-up on Michael York after Mercutio is mortally wounded, which is so important because up until that point, Tybalt can be judged as an irredeemable bad guy, who fully embraces the hatred of this feud, but this shows that he's just another kid getting caught up in something that never should have gotten this far. Through Tybalt's story, you see how dangerous a combination of a fragile ego and the escalation of trash talking and scrapping can be. Even at the party, Tybalt seeing that Romeo and his friends had crashed did not send him into attack mode. The first thing he did was run to the adults and tattle on Romeo. He doesn't jump into violence until there is zero parental supervision. The emotional immaturity of these boys is further demonstrated when Romeo is completely hysterical and inconsolable after he has just killed Tybalt. It's such a loud expression of emotion, but it also shows how young and immature he is. He could not control his emotions when Mercutio was killed any better than he could control his emotions when he killed Tybalt himself. The Lerman Romeo and Juliet also shows some really smart choices in addressing the emotions and violence of these boys. When Romeo is pleading with Tybalt to be satisfied, whenever they cut to Tybalt's face, John Leguizamo is very clearly emoting the inner conflict Tybalt is experiencing. Tybalt can't handle someone he thinks he's supposed to hate bearing their emotions to him to this degree, so he lashes out even more. When Mercutio decides to intervene in their confrontation, he takes out his gun and makes a conscious choice to not bring it with him. Further proof that even with how toxic this feud is, it was never supposed to escalate to that degree of danger. Even if some of them do threaten each other with their pieces at various points in the film. I always loved the way Boz Lerman took a high octane approach to Romeo's retaliation to Mercutio's death, the high speed car chase, Romeo screaming at Tybalt, the score amping up, and just the overall energy and volume being so high, even Leonardo DiCaprio having his tears vibrating because he's shaking with rage, only for all of that noise to drop to almost nothing and the way they keep the tight close-up on his expression changing as it really sinks in what it is that he's just done. West Side Story consistently does a great job at showing how the Jets and the Sharks are both groups of young boys getting into trouble and mischief. The interactions they have with the different adults in the story show this. At the beginning, you see it quickly established that these two groups have more in common than they really Realize when Bernardo sasses the police, the Jets laugh at his joke. Would you mind translating that into Spanish? <laughs> They're more than capable of playing nice when it suits them, and this whole notion of them being big, tough gangs often reads more like children playing a game. We are suspicion that the job was done by a cop. Hey, Doc, you ain't gonna close up now. I'm not. Listen, we got a war council here. Two cops, at the very least. Impossible. In America, nothing is impossible. A game that stops being fun once people start getting seriously hurt. It's unfathomable to me how simple-minded the mainstream analysis of Romeo and Juliet continues to be, particularly when there is such a powerful adaptation to better contextualize the material to the audience. Some of you might be wondering when I'm going to finally start talking about the new film adaptation of West Side Story. Don't worry, we are approaching our final destination, but it's very important to have an understanding of the source material and understand how the musical adapts it and expands on it to more closely resemble the world as we know it today. The 1961 film adaptation is brilliant on so many levels, it has been deemed culturally significant and deservedly so. West Side Story is truly a technical masterpiece. The film won 10 Academy Awards, two of those Oscars went to Rita Moreno and George Chakiris for their acting, and the scoring and dancing are truly exquisite. To this day, the film's opening 
Lightning is one of the greatest sequences in cinematic history. It exemplifies the power of musicals and storytelling through the art of music, dance, and film. There's a good 10 minutes of world building and character content with almost no dialogue. The story covers all the aforementioned themes that we see throughout the original play and other noteworthy adaptations, but the musical is brilliant for being even more blatant in addressing bigotry. There's a tremendous amount of empathy for both the Jets and the Sharks. Officer Krupke is a song that lays out the trajectory of the hard lives the Jets have faced from the time that they're born and get swept up into a system that doesn't care about them. For example, the lyrics, our mothers all are junkies, our fathers all are drunks, golly Moses naturally were punks. Social workers, judges, psychiatrists, no one can manage to get these kids back on track. There is one lyric in the song that I'm curious to see if they will keep as is or if they'll change it to make it more palatable to a 21st century audience. It's the line, my sister wears a mustache, my brother wears a dress. Goodness gracious, that's why I'm a mess. If the musical is keeping the setting in decades past, you can make the argument that it's period accurate ignorance, but if this new adaptation will be set in the present, leaving the line as is will inevitably lead to outraged clickbait articles acting like Steven Spielberg just did the worst thing ever because outrage is the new currency on the internet. But by far my favorite song in the musical is America. It's one of the most sharp, witty songs from any musical. The lyrics are so smart and eerily relevant even today. The film goes in the creative direction of splitting the Puerto Rican girls and boys so they get to play this really cool tension off one another. The girls sing lines that convey the spirit of the American dream, of seeking out new opportunities in New York City, while the boys sing lines that are more cynical about the harsh realities about how immigrants and people of color are treated in America. Some comparisons include, I'll get a terrace apartment, better get rid of your accent. Life is all right in America, if you're a white in America. It's been over 50 years since this film came out, and it's safe to say that society has learned absolutely nothing from this musical. The way Puerto Rico continues to be treated by the mainland? Not great! How is that hurricane relief going? Did they receive all of the support and aid that they needed? Did you forget that Puerto Rico is in fact a US territory. But it's no surprise really because like I said, Romeo and Juliet and the many adaptations of it continue to be misunderstood as stories that are first and foremost about forbidden love, which is such a juvenile and asinine way of analyzing the material. And this type of analysis of storytelling is rampant in both the production and consumption of entertainment media. Why is the music industry overrun with so many bland and unoriginal songs about love and relationships? Now, as much as I love this source material and the musical and the film adaptation of that musical, which is brilliant on all these technical levels of filmmaking, acting, music, dancing, the list goes on and on. There is one very noteworthy critique that I need to address because if I didn't, it would be spitting in the face of everything that this story is about. The main blemish on the legacy of the 1961 film adaptation of West Side Story comes down to casting. Meet Maria and Bernardo, a brother and sister from Puerto Rico that have come to New York City in search of better opportunities and a better life. Maria is played by Natalie Wood, the child of white Russian immigrants, and Bernardo is played by George Chakiris, who is the child of Greek immigrants. Neither one of these performers are Latin, nor are they people of color. It's important to note that not all Latin people are people of of color, you can be white and Latin. I've looked at different photos and videos of George Chakiris from different points in his career and his complexion does fluctuate a bit, perhaps you can chalk that up to him spending more or less time in the sun, but he has also stated in interviews that makeup was applied to him so his skin would be more brown. Therefore, it is reasonable to presume that the intention of this adaptation was that these Puerto Ricans are supposed to be people of color. During one take, one pair split up the back. It, it, it was not a sort of material that stretched. Hey, I, I was dark makeup, but I was not made up back here. I had to change to the other pair of pants. And they split as well, and there were only two. So finally what they did was they, I put on a pair of black, black tights 
and put the, the black trousers over it, so of course you never saw anything. But there was a malfunction. I ruined uh, both pairs of pants. Now, I want to be very clear here when I say that I am not attacking Natalie Wood or George Chakiris as performers or as people. That would be a very oversimplified way of looking at things. This is about the larger systemic issues at play that have consistently limited or outright excluded Latin actors from getting their fair share of leading roles, along with people of color and people with darker complexions. To have the sharks be very clearly brown-skinned Puerto Ricans can be a good thing if the intention is to shine a spotlight on the aggression and violence that this community of people receives and how wrong that is. But it's ironic and hypocritical to be adapting a story that is so intelligent and direct in addressing these very issues just for you to say, no, let's not cast a Latina to play Maria. Let's not cast a Latino to play Bernardo. Make no mistake, Natalie and George are fantastic at what they do. Natalie is devastating in the best way when she gives the final monologue of the film. It's downright chilling how she is pushed to her breaking point and nearly goes over the edge. While the other characters in the story have displayed a pattern of lashing out after seeing a loved one taken down by this violence, Maria is ready to fire on the people that have been perpetuating this violence but ultimately decides not to. Even though it's clear by the look on her face that her innocence has now been lost, she will have to carry the trauma of this violent loss for the rest of her life. Before George was cast, he had played Riff in the London production of West Side Story, and you can very clearly see in the film how elegant a dancer he is. He plays the range of Bernardo beautifully, from the strong protector of his loved ones, a leader of his crew, a lover, a fighter, and the remorse and vulnerability I talked about before that he shows in the character's final moments. The outspoken critics of being inclusive will undoubtedly try to justify these casting choices or try to paint these out as exceptions. They're not. The evidence is entirely clear when we look at the career of Rita Moreno, who is actually Latina. She won an Oscar for her brilliant performance as Anita, and guess what happened afterwards? She didn't do another film for seven years because of how abysmal her options were. I didn't do a film for seven years after West Side Story. I won an Oscar and I won the Golden Globe and uh, no movie for seven years. I finally went to audition. I was desperate for a uh, featured role in a, in a movie seven years later. I went into the uh, director's office and he was surrounded by his minions. It's my favorite show business story. And I said to him, and I worked real hard on the script. I said, I can't wait. I had the script, the scene in my hand. I said, I can't wait to do the scene for you because I think I have a real handle on it. And I've worked really hard on it. And he looks at the script and there's this awkward silence. He was English. He says, oh, no, darling, no. He says, uh, this isn't the, ro the role we wanted you to read for. What we brought you in for was to read for the Mexican whorehouse madam. Oh, I had you. won an Oscar, a Tony, a Grammy, two Emmys at that uh -huh. point. I had to get myself together first. And I just mustered up all of my dignity. I said, I'm sorry, I don't. I don't do whorehouse madams. And he said, wait, wait. And uh, he said, oh, no, no, darling. He said, you don't understand. I said, no, you don't understand. <laughs> When I first found out that there was going to be a new feature film adaptation of West Side Story, and more specifically the fact that Steven Spielberg was the one that was making it, it was a bit surprising. I think the natural reaction to any sort of news announcement about a work of fiction being readapted, particularly one that you have an emotional attachment to that stems back to your childhood, the natural reflex is to be concerned because you want it to be done well. As you can probably tell from the massive amount of waffling that I've done in this video, this is a work of fiction that I value a lot in its many forms, whether it's the play or this specific musical or the 1961 film adaptation of it. Naturally, if it's going to be adapted again, I want it to be good. Once I got over those first few seconds of shock and surprise that this was new information that I was receiving, I started to get really excited. First of all, let's address the fact that Steven Spielberg is the one that is doing this adaptation. I should not have to explain who Steven Spielberg is. It does not matter if you are not somebody on film Twitter or film YouTube. You can be a very casual consumer of film as an art form and you are still going to know who Steven Spielberg is. The level of success that this man has in his career, the amount of respect that he has from his peers and from fans of 
the iconic films that are in his body of work. This is a man who has all the options in the world as far as what type of story he wants to make, what genre, how he wants this film to be distributed, whether he has a specific studio in mind that he wants to collaborate with, or if he wants to work with one of the many new streaming platforms that are trying to build up their names. With all these different options that he has, and he chooses to adapt West Side Story, I love a director with taste. With everything that's going on in the industry and everything that's going on in the world in its entirety, West Side Story is the exact type of fiction that we need. Maybe if more people had learned from the musical when it first came out as a feature film in 1961, we would not have as many problems as we do right now. I'll admit I was a bit surprised by the casting of Ansel Elgort just because I didn't really see him as somebody that I would think of when it comes time to do casting for musicals. I know that he does some side projects to do with music, but I haven't really looked at them all that closely, so I don't have an opinion on that. It's not as if Steven Spielberg isn't going to have options when he's casting for his lead male role, so I am not going to be all that fussed about it until I can actually see it and judge for myself. If Steven Spielberg thinks that this is the right person to play it, then I would like to see what they do with the role. Now to the matter of this video title. I promise I did not put Rachel Zegler's name in the title just for kicks. I have a point to make here. I will be completely honest, I did not know who Rachel Zegler was before she was cast. She is a newcomer by Hollywood standards anyway, her professional experience is in the world of musical theater, so she definitely already had an audience and fans, but I started following her on Twitter a while ago because I've known that I wanted to make this video and I wanted to get a sense of how she was as a person. I don't know her personally, but at the bare minimum of how she conducts herself on Twitter, I find her to be delightful. She has a reputation for being a stan of Oscar de Saque Hernandez Estrada, so right off the bat we have to give her credit for having taste. She can sing, she posts in a way that indicates an understanding and empathy for a multitude of socially ostracized groups and the importance of representation in media. What more can I ask for? When we look back at West Side Story 1961 and the one particularly noteworthy blemish on its legacy, this isn't about taking anything away from Natalie Wood's abilities as an actress. What it is about is the systemic exclusion and excessive obstacles that Latin and ethnic talent face in and out of the industry. Natalie Wood had the opportunity to be in a streetcar named Desire and get momentum going in her career that helped to nudge her along when it came time to audition for Maria. Rachel Zegler seems like a singer and actress that, from what I can tell, got this job because of her skills, not because she was boosted by nepotism or by dating some A-list Hollywood actor that got her extra attention from the media. Her ability to portray this character should be the most important deciding factor in whether or not she gets cast, but we cannot overlook how important it is that she is actually Latina, playing this character and in turn inspiring what will undoubtedly be generations of young Latin talent to pursue their dreams of going into the entertainment industry. People can try to be dismissive of this whole conversation and act like it's just a film, but it's not. This is life. This is everything. It's the essence of who we are. It's the legacy we leave behind for future generations to judge this period of history by. A film like this, with a story that addresses these issues in such an effective way, holds so much power to teach the audience about very important topics like the dangers of hatred, bigotry, and violence. I am well aware of the fact that on film Twitter nowadays, the common trend is to be upset and outraged anytime a work of fiction that you loved in your childhood is getting readapted, but doing so for something like West Side Story would be absolutely ridiculous because of the fact that it is a musical and musicals tend to be adapted again and again through different stage productions. And considering the fact that West Side Story specifically is adapted from a Shakespeare play and Shakespeare's works have been readapted and reimagined and drawn on for creative inspiration, through works of fiction for hundreds of years now. I just don't see any reason for me to be upset about a new West Side Story film coming out. It's been over 50 years. It's not like you didn't give it room to breathe. And besides, it's not like Steven Spielberg is going to CGI Rachel Zegler's face onto the body of a cat. So really, I have nothing to be worried about. And with that, I think it's about time that I stopped waffling about West Side Story. The video script that I made for this topic ended up being over eight pages long. <laughs> 
And that was me trying to keep it condensed and tight. There are so many other tangents that I could have gone on related to this film adaptation of West Side Story, for example, the fact that the sharks and their girlfriends look amazing at the dance. I love I'm borderline obsessed with the color coordination of the purples and the reds. Can you tell I took inspiration when I was painting my face to shoot this video? Yeah. I also could have gone way more in depth about how rewatching the film as a cynical adult was a very different experience. I was prepared to be completely dismissive of Tony and Maria as this couple, considering that they are the ones who are representing the characters of Romeo and Juliet. But then when it came time for Richard and Natalie to be emoting while lip syncing to Tonight, and it's just so well written and they're great performers that I was really starting to feel it. I was you know, getting some chest pains watching it of, oh no, the Grinch's heart is growing three sizes. But then when the song is more or less completely finished and Tony is preparing to leave and then he turns around and he looks at her and he just goes, I love you. Uh, the sound that I made, it was just very, very dismissive. I'm pretty sure it was something like, oh, because you're not in love with her. You've had one conversation with her. Does the weird non-talking at the dance even count as a conversation? You think she's cute. She thinks you're cute. You would like to hang out and hook up and everything in between. And that's perfectly fine, but you are not in love with her. You don't know anything about her. What does she want to do in America? Does she have bigger aspirations than working in a bridal dress shop? You don't know anything about her. I'm so, I need to not, I need to not do this today. Please like this video so I can know that this work wasn't for nothing. <laughs> And comment to tell me what your favorite musicals are. I have several. West Side Story is definitely one of them. If you follow me on Twitter, then you know that I have a very, very overbearing propensity to rant about Grease 2 and Grease 1 for very different reasons. And I would love for more people to validate my desire to make a video about them because I've wanted to for ages now and I would love to have a reason to go back and finish the script. And the only reason that I haven't is because I just felt like the amount of work that I'm gonna put into that topic when I finally do it is way too much for me to do right now unless I know that people are actually interested in seeing me talk about that. But if you say that you're ready to hear it, then I'm more than prepared to do it. But actually one more thing before we go, do we all remember when Vanity Fair did that West Side Story photo shoot? I think it was about a decade ago. Here's the thing. I know that most people nowadays, if they were gonna talk about that photo shoot, they would probably want to talk about the fact that Chris Evans was playing Riff. I don't care about that. What I care about is the fact that Ben Barnes was Tony. <sighs> Listen, why has no one in Hollywood ever put Ben Barnes in a giant musical? What more does this man have to do to show you that he has the talent, he has the range? Why has this not happened yet? I am full of rage. You know what? Let's not do this today. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and Vero to get more of my running commentary on the various works of fiction that I have opinions about. I know the next couple videos that I want to work on, I have some topics in mind, but I might let some other ones slip in there. Maybe some more recent cinematic releases, depending on which ones end up actually being worth talking about in depth. Subscribe so you don't miss any of my new content coming up. And don't forget that Anita is the best character in West Side Story. See you in the next one. Bye. What happens when you look at Ben Nath? It's when I don't look that it happens. We won't bite you till we know you better. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know which is thicker, your skull or your accent.